and thank you for being here. This is the Aquafix 2020 webinar series. I'm your presenter, John, and I'm the technical service manager at Aquafix. Today's topic is going to be eliminating redworms and midge flies in wastewater. First, just real quick, a bit of background about Aquafix. We're a microbiology lab based in the University of Wisconsin Research Park. Um, you can see in the bottom right, our microbiologist and chemist, Dan, there are a couple of the key figures in our lab, and they spend a lot of time each week analyzing samples that come in from wastewater plants all across the country, helping operators solve some of their toughest challenges. They do a lot of microscopic work, really known for filament ID, but do all sorts of observations during uh, typical microanalysis. As a company, we also make and sell bacterial cultures, probiotic stimulants, and biocatalysts that speed the rates of reactions. Uh, so a lot of the things that we learn in those microanalysis and helping operators solve some of those challenges end up getting put into those formulations. And now for the reason that we are all here today, uh, a lot of you probably recognize one or both of the things on your screen. On the left, this is the common wastewater midge fly. And on the right is some of its larval stage, the, the common redworm. So what are these things? Uh, they're a species of non-biting midge. They're pretty closely related to the mosquito, but they are in a separate family. The redworm is the larva stage, and the species we're talking about here is Coronimus. Couple defining features on the left for the redworms. They are up to about two inches long. They are, as mentioned, the larval stage, so they're not actually even truly a worm. And they have this characteristic red color. That red color is actually hemoglobin, uh, the same thing that helps absorb oxygen in, in human blood. Uh, it's hemoglobin is what gives these worms their, their red color. On the right then, the actual midge flies, because of that close relation to the mosquito, they tend to look quite a bit like a mosquito and, and are actually often misidentified as mosquitoes, but they don't have a stinger, uh, so they're not gonna bite you. One other feature is a feather-like antenna that is gonna be on some of the flies, and that's the male of the species. This next slide here, we have a species of midge that's got a very distinct antenna. Um, so if you have midge flies in your plant, feel free to go look. A percentage of them should have this antenna, maybe a little bit less dramatic than the one in this picture since this is actually a different species of midge. And where do they come from? Midges exist pretty much all across the entire world um, and exist naturally. The only parts of the world that don't have midges are gonna be the driest desert. And the reason for that is that midges exist primarily near natural water bodies, and that's because their larvae get laid into those natural water bodies. As a species, they're very well adapted to anoxic or low dissolved oxygen water conditions and poor water quality conditions. But the uh, larvae then feed on organics when they're out in nature, to decomposing leaves and that kind of thing. And they tend to live in pretty marginal quality water, or they're at least better adapted to, to live there compared to many species. The fly and the larvae are actually both an important species uh, for fish. So any fly fisherman, fly fisherwoman attending um, probably have seen ties or flies that are tied to resemble the midge. And there's even flies that are tied to resemble the larva as well. Here's a quick diagram of the cycle, and then we'll go through each of the stages briefly. But basically, adult male and female live in the sky. Female lays eggs, hatches to the larva, quick pupa stage, and then pupa turns back into the, the adult flies. One of the things I wanted to note here is that the rate that this cycle happens at can be accelerated in wastewater treatment plants compared to out in nature. And that's one of several reasons why outbreaks of this pest can get so bad in wastewater plants. Not all wastewater plants will ever deal with this issue. In fact, probably a majority of them will not. Hard to say the exact number, but somewhere between 20 and 30%, just my kind of general observation of wastewater plants, will end up having a significant outbreak at some point in time. So how do those flies end up in the wastewater plant? Pretty similar to how they reproduce and end up in any water body. So the female lands in calmer, slow moving water. In wastewater plants, this tends to be secondary clarifiers, lays thousands of eggs, and it usually will begin during the warmer months 
uh, with lower flows, but then plants that end up having a significant population will then carry that population basically on an ongoing basis continuously until it's dealt with. So now we'll look at some of those stages more specifically. The red worm is the actual worm itself is probably the biggest reason that people who operate wastewater plants that have these end up needing to deal with it. When those eggs hatch, they hatch into the red worm, the larval stage, again, not a true worm, but the worms begin feasting on the mixed liquor. So they're eating your good bacteria. The wastewater plant provides a very nutrient rich environment. So the worms tend to grow really fast and have a very high survival rate. It's basically the, the perfect place for these things to grow up. The larval stage will last several weeks, faster in warmer temperature times, and then significantly slower during cold weather months. In fact, throughout the winter months when the worms go dormant, typically the larval stage can last months. And then once they get established in the secondary clarifiers, return activated sludge will move the population to the aeration basin. Some aeration basins they will thrive in, some aeration basins they will not thrive in. And there's a couple factors we'll touch on later that can influence whether or not they thrive in the aeration basin. But then they can also move downstream as well. Uh, we'll talk about a few of the areas they can uh, end up there. But one thing they're always seeking to do is burrow into the organics wherever they're accumulated, or they'll actually proactively form what we call cocoons, where they'll take bits of sludge and organics and essentially build themselves a little cocoon. Here is a slide that shows some examples of these cocoonings. Uh, we got a ring on a clarifier here, and you can see on the wall of it on the left-hand picture, some of these little bumps almost looks like shaggy dog hair on the one on the right. But if you were to scrape these in a plant that has a bunch of red worms, you would see just masses of these worms come out of the scrapings. I think the picture on the right is a rake on a square clarifier, maybe. The issues caused by the worms, first off, as I mentioned, they're consuming valuable mixed liquor. And we've seen cases where this really gets pretty bad and can have some serious impacts on the ability for the plant to achieve good treatment. As these worms are eating, they can exist in the millions in a wastewater plant, and the amount of mixed liquor they eat adds up. We've heard of more than one case or been involved in more than one case where the untreated red worm population was eating so much mixed liquor that the concentration in the basin was going down, 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 and the operators were decreasing wasting to the point that they had stopped wasting entirely, and then got to the point where even with no wasting, their mixed liquor was disappearing. So you can imagine the issues that, that would cause for treatments. A few other things that they can cause, especially in the secondary clarifiers, they can almost cause some kind of like clumping or sticking together of the sludge and the clarifiers. Operators have noted that they get a thin return activated sludge when they're doing their returns, almost kind of like a stringiness, I guess has been the way it's described. And you can end up with rising solids in the clarifier as well when there's a big population. So the red worm then hatches into the pupa stage, and this is a very short-lived stage. Basically, the worm turns into a pupa, and then within a matter of hours can hatch into an adult fly. This is a picture we just got recently from an operator who had a bunch of these midge pupa. They were getting ready to have a pretty major hatch of midge flies at this time, it looked like, based on the number that were all coming up. Um, those would all be emerging relatively quickly as midge flies. And then next, it's on to the adult stage. The males swarm around, they're focused on mating, uh, the females are too, and their adult lifespan is basically going to be about two days. They're not really going to eat during that time. They've done all of their consumption of food in the larva stage. At this point, they basically come up into the sky, swarm, mate, and then the female lays eggs for the next round. Again, that, that adult lifespan is maybe up to two days. But the flies themselves can become a pretty major nuisance for operators, especially if you have to work in an enclosed space with them. They also tend to generate complaints from neighbors if your plant's located near residential. They can impact people's ability to enjoy time outside, especially since the worst of these problems start right up at the time when temperatures are warming, people are wanting to be outside on their porches and patios, and they don't want huge swarms of these flies interfering with those activities. Another reason that the flies end up becoming a problem is because they attract other pests. 
So when I go to a treatment plant, if I see swallows swooping over the clarifiers, it's one pretty strong indication that they almost definitely have a bunch of redworms in those clarifiers. Those barn swallows are swooping down, eating the flies that are hatching off the water. The flies can also attract spiders, and this can be just a general housekeeping issue in terms of appearance, but can also end up causing issues if the flies are emerging in an enclosed area. They can end up with a lot of spiders and can actually cause some significant housekeeping issues. So that's kind of the background on what we're talking about and how these things operate. Uh, next, we'll just get into treatment, which is really effective and pretty easy to do. So at Aquafix, we do the Aquabac XT. It's a biolarvicide. It is registered by the EPA, and it breaks that cycle by killing the worms. The active ingredient in Aquabac is BTI. And I'll talk to you a little more about what BTI is and, and how it works. But at this point, I guess just know that it comes in an 8% concentration. So BTI is an abbreviation. Uh, its active ingredient is actually a bacteria strain called Bacillus thuringiensis, subspecies Israelius. It was discovered in 1976 in Israel. And they discovered that there were no mosquito larvae in the body of water that it was found in and subsequent testing found that it was able to kill a specific set of flies that are closely related to the mosquito. So in addition to killing the midge fly, obviously it kills the mosquito, it'll kill the black fly and the filter fly. And we have had indications in our lab uh, that it'll kill the bristle worm as well. So the active ingredient is really specific in its targets and that makes it very safe to use in a wastewater process. No effluent toxicity issues, it's not going to have any effect on Daphnia or minnows or really any other non-target species. It's just a very limited set of fly larvae that it's able to kill. Also safe for humans, standard wastewater operator PPE is fine for applying it. The way it actually kills the flies is it's as sold in the jug, it's in the spore forming stage. Again, it's a bacteria. You add it to the water, typically a secondary clarifier, although there can be other dosing locations as well. And then the bacteria, once they get into the water, begin creating a protein that then gets consumed by the, the larva stage, by the redworms. That protein gets activated when it's in the stomach of the redworm, and it's the alkalinity in the worm's stomach specifically that activates this protein. And when activated, it produces six separate endotoxins. Those endotoxins bind to the cells in the digestive tract of the redworm, the cells rupture, and ultimately the worm starves to death. One of the reasons that we love Aquabac and the BTI ingredient is that there's never going to be any resistance formed to it. These six toxins work really effectively together. In fact, the combination of the six is better than the sum of each individual part. But one thing that helps uh, prevent resistance is that it is six separate toxins. So this bacteria strain has been studied since it was discovered in the 1970s. And there have been continuous studies looking for resistance over that time. And there is yet to be a, a single documented case of the, the insects develop or the larva developing a resistance to it. Next, we'll talk about actual dosing in a wastewater treatment plant. One thing that Aquafix provides is what we call our product sheets. This is an example of the product sheet for our Aquabac and one of the companion products here, Bug Juice. But you can kind of see these are available on our website, free to download. You get a little brief description of what Aquabac XT is and how it works and then dosing instructions. And we will go over those dosing instructions now. It's added directly to the area where the red worms are at. So almost always the worms are going to be in the secondary clarifiers. So we'll always start by saying, yeah, you're going to dose there. We typically, as a maintenance dose, we'll be having operators do a slug dose once per week. So just once per week, someone goes out with the jug, splits it between the clarifiers, whatever the recommended dose is. It is possible to do a metering pump and set it up on a, a metered dose. And this can be a good option for larger plants that don't want to have to carry around quantities of the product that would get fairly large if we're talking in the multiple millions of gallons per day. We recommend that maintenance dose during the entire active season of the midge flies. And when new plants start up, especially if they have a, a bad issue with the midges to begin with, then we start with what we call our initial dose for the first two weeks 
where for the first two weeks, you would be doing a little heavier dose and you would do it twice per week for those first two weeks. If you have a really bad outbreak, you can go super dose if you need really fast results. And then we typically recommend one additional round of that heavier initial dose for two weeks in the fall before the flies go dormant, just so you can knock out any remaining ones and go into winter with kind of a clean slate. And so I mentioned we add this to the areas where the red worms are the worst. Again, typically secondary clarifiers, although if you have them, say, in your UV room, then you may add some of the product just uh, immediately ahead of your UV, for example. So what happens in winter climates in Wisconsin, where Aquafix is based, or really most parts of the Midwest, any of the northern climates, the flies do die off, but the worms don't. The worms just go dormant. It's one common misconception that they've gone away in the winter, but really anything other than being frozen solid isn't going to kill them. So typically they're just going dormant and they can even remain active in certain scenarios. So <clears throat> covered clarifiers, for example, even in cold climates, if your secondary clarifier is covered, we've seen uh, lots of instances where the population can stay active through the entire winter. A few of those situations where the worms might exist beyond what I've already mentioned in the clarifiers uh, or aeration basin based on return sludge. Disc filters, the worms are pretty happy to burrow into the media in most disc filters or sand filters. UV rooms, in this case, uh, they may exist in the channels, especially if there's some sludge built up in the bottoms of the channels where the worms can burrow into that or they may just be pupating in the clarifiers and then emerging inside the UV. This particular UV room, is, you can see, is enclosed on the right and looks really nice, but again, this is one of those things where you imagine the pests that those flies can attract. Certain times in the past before treatment, this thing was just covered in, in spider webs and looked really pretty dirty and not nearly as attractive as it does here. So as mentioned, Aquabac is extremely effective at killing the, the red worms. It will kill essentially all of them that it comes into contact with. The only thing that limits the effectiveness in a wastewater treatment plant is any worms that are protected from actual exposure to the product. And so I had mentioned cocooning. That's one of those factors that can be somewhat limiting in the wastewater plant. Even in the worst cases, we still tend to get dramatic knockback using the Aquabac XT. And so now I'm just going to go over ways to boost the treatment effectiveness. And the first is dealing with cocooning. So here you see examples of some of these cocoons. On the left, a ring of a clarifier. On the right, again, back to that clarifier rake. So if you were to scrape any one of these, again, it's filled with worms. If you were to add Aquabac, the worms that are inside those cocoons are not necessarily going to be contacted by the active ingredient and may not die and could then potentially still hatch into flies and limit your overall treatment results. The other one is sludge. So they don't need to necessarily even make themselves a cocoon if we're dealing with a system that's got a lot of sludge at the bottom. Say, like on the left here, you can see this aeration basin, you can see the aerators. If there's a couple inches or a foot of sludge, that can just become totally infested with the worms. So this is any of that reddish tone that you're seeing in the picture on the left, that is all just masses of red worms by the millions. Another example on the right here of just uh, what sludge can look like built up in the bottom of a basin. So dealing with that to expose more of the worms to the active ingredient in Aquabac is one thing we like to focus on. And to do that, we use a product called Bug Juice. And it's just a catalyst that helps degrade the things that these worms are making their cocoons out of and also helps degrade some of the stuff that settles out in the bottoms of basins, that sludge. Uh, net effect is that it just exposes more of the worms to the Aquabac XT treatment. It'll help to degrade those cocoons on the walls of basins, weirs, as well as any dead spots in, say, your aeration basin or sludge that's built up in UV channels, for example. Bug juice is usually added daily uh, at the head of the plant. Some plants will use it for year-round treatment, or at least as long as they're adding the Aquabac XT. Some plants will use it just for, say, the first 40 days of treatment. And again, we've got dosing information here. 
in a typical million gallon per day plant, you'd use about a little over a gallon of the bug juice once per day, say for the first 40 days. Uh, Aquabac XT dosing, I guess I had intended to talk to you about what the actual dose was in case you didn't read it, but the maintenance dose per million gallons of flow on Aquabac is gonna be a little over a gallon once per week. Timeline for results. Operators are usually seeing significant improvements within the first 14 days. Uh, dramatic knockback of the midge flies and redworms almost always is going to occur within the first 14 days. And usually you're going to be seeing full results at around 30 days. Usually we're talking about knocking out 90 plus percent of the population of redworms when you do a treatment like this within those 30 days. We do have one other companion product I'll mention. So in cases where the midge fly and redworm population was out of control and did have a devastating impact on the mixed liquor, we have a product called Vitastim Rebuild that can help bring the mixed liquor back quickly. It's a blend of heterotrophic bacteria as well as some probiotics to help those bacteria get established. And if you have uh, a missing mixed liquor related to the worms, something like 15 to 30 days of adding this at the beginning of your aquabac treatment can really help bring the plant back quickly. The only real alternative to the BT product aquabac in terms of uh, treatment of the midge flies that we've come across is one where the active ingredient is methoprene. That's a chemical insecticide. It's actually a hormone analog that acts as a growth regulator for the insects, and that's how it works to kill them. In wastewater plants, you end up with successive generations of midge flies in a very closed system. So there's certainly wild flies that come into the system as well, but the population all tends to be very closely related. And because those successive generations happen so quickly in a wastewater plant, and in such an isolated environment, it speeds the rate that they develop resistance to chemical treatments like methoprene. In a wastewater plant, resistance at a certain point is pretty much guaranteed with continued use. And that's why we like Aquabac, uh, because it can't develop resistance. A couple more unique situations. Uh, if you operate a lagoon, don't worry, we haven't forgot about you. Definitely, these flies can lay their eggs in lagoons. They're perfectly happy there. The worms are happy with the sludge on the bottom, plenty of bacteria for them to eat. And so we do treatment based on the size of the lagoon and the number of acre feet. And one other thing we like to focus on, again, like with the bug juice, exposing more of the worms to the treatment. In lagoons, the way we address sludge is a little bit different. We use a product called Sludge RX, which is a bacterial tablet. That product was developed for helping lagoon operators who wanted to avoid the cost of dredging their lagoon, but it is really effective at exposing more of the worms in a lagoon as well as it degrades those sludge deposits. Dosing on that one's around 30 to 60 pounds per surface acre, and you do that once per month. The Aquabac dosing in lagoons, we do an initial dose for the first four weeks in this case, and for a typical wastewater lagoon that is, say, six to eight feet deep, one acres in size, you'd be looking at about two and a half gallons once per week for those first four weeks, and then after that, about a gallon once per week. Another special situation is trickling filters. We get calls periodically from folks who have filter fly outbreaks. This is a different species from the midge fly. It's pictured here in the bottom left, and they're extremely common in trickling filters. Their larvae, instead of red, tends to be a brownish or tannish color and quite a bit smaller. This fly also tends to be quite a bit smaller. And the larvae like to live on the media in uh, trickling filters. And pretty similar in terms of what they're doing, they're eating bacteria off the, off the media. And so the question that comes in is, will this product kill them? And we've got plenty of examples of that, yes, it will. There's a study done through the University of Wales that I have starred here on the bottom right where you can learn more about that. But the general recommendation for feeding the Aquabac is a little different in trickling filters. What you wanna do is there's a range of anywhere from 10 to 50 parts per million concentration of the Aquabac you wanna get into the waste stream and then get it evenly distributed across the media for a period of 30 minutes. 
And so we can work with you to help figure out exactly what that looks like in your system if you're a trickling filter operator. But usually you're able to use the distribution bars to help get the treatment spread out evenly. Another special situation, possibly some of you have been watching this presentation and saying, yeah, that kind of sounds like us, but I haven't seen any midge flies in my system. And my worms are red, but they're a little bit different looking than what we've seen so far. Chances that maybe you have a different species of worm that's actually a true worm, possibly the tube effects worm, and we have some examples of those pictured here. A common name for that is the sewer worm. The aquabac will not kill those, we know that. And it's kind of an emerging area in wastewater research at this point that we're really focusing on is what to do about these tube effects worms. You can learn more about the state of that research at our website. I think if you just type in wastewater tube effects worm, Aquafix should be pretty high in the search results. And you can learn a little bit more about that if this is your situation. Uh, anyone else who's unsure, never hurts to just take a picture and shoot us an email and say, here's what we're dealing with. What do you think? Other resources, we have more upcoming webinars. That's actually going to be it for the Midge Fly and Red Worm webinar. Next one up is going to be about lagoon sludge reduction. So if the Sludge RX product sounded interesting to you just purely from a sludge reduction in lagoon standpoint, that'll be the next topic. We'll also do later in the year anaerobic digester stability, do some uh, really nice popular one about microscopic evaluations for wastewater operators, and then finish the year with a presentation on foaming filaments. So as I had mentioned, we are available for questions. You can use the question box or the chat box, and I'll stick around and wait for some questions to come in. First question that came in, is this going to be a one-time treatment or am I going to have to treat more than once? You'll need to treat for the duration of the midge fly's active season. So again, in the Midwest, that's the warmer months, spring through fall, say in Ohio, for example, you probably would be looking at starting treatment around April, maybe March, and going through late fall, late October, early November. Other parts of the country, say Southern Florida, for example, it's a year round thing down there. It just doesn't get cold enough to really ever knock the flies out. Anywhere in the United States from say, six months of the year to 12 months of the year, just based on what the climate's like in your area. Question, are you sending out this presentation? We will have this presentation available. You'll be able to watch this full recording seven days from now. Everyone who registered will get a link on where they need to go to view that recording, but you can also view any of our previous presentations at our website. And to get to that, you just look at the top of the page, webinar archives, and there will be a recorded version of each of them there. Yeah, another question about, will we need to treat every year? Most plants, I would say, are going to be doing it on a yearly basis. There are some where you truly just do knock them out in a single season and they never come back. That's maybe 30% of the plants that I've worked with, I would say, where you do the treatment for one season, knock them out, and they don't come back. But I would say probably the bulk of plants are going to be doing the treatment each year. Another question, do we have a large percentage of plants that, that use this product? I think, I, I don't know an exact number, but in terms of how many plants suffer from midge fly and redworm issues, I would say it's probably at least 30% have it to the point where it needs to be addressed at some point. Probably a lot more have just minor issues with them. I would say most plants have at least had a midge fly in them at some point. And then it's just a matter of on how many of them does it actually become a big deal. And I'm thinking maybe 30%. A lot of it has to do with what the local geography is like in your area. Areas that have a lot of low-lying areas, a lot of water, basically anywhere that's mosquito prone is going to be more likely to have uh, native midge flies out and about. And so that can definitely increase the chances. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's about it for questions. Everyone can certainly feel free to send me an email. My email is going to be info at teamaquafix.com is the general one, and I'll end up getting it. Or you can use john, J-O-H-N dot D at Team Aquafix, or just give us a call at the phone number there. Be happy to put together dosing plans and see what pricing might look like for your system. 
Hope everyone found this helpful and we will see you at the next webinar in June. Thank you.